Hello everyone and welcome. Thanks for being here. This is Michael Conley, HP CareerNet and Health Promotion Live. Uh, good to see you. I'm happy that uh, you're here. Let me remind you that before I turn it over to Kelly to introduce Ron, that uh, this is being recorded, will be available later this afternoon if uh, you have colleagues who aren't available uh, to participate live. Um, and if you have questions during the webinar, type them into the chat box. We'll get through as many as we possibly can um, towards the end. And I think that's all I've got. All right. So today we have Ron Getzel. Dr. Getzel is a task force member of the Guided Community Preventative Services housed at the CDC and the president and CEO of the Health Project, which annually awards organizations the prestigious C. Everett Coop National Health Award, for the demonstrable health improvement and cost savings from health promotion and disease prevention programs. Before joining Reuter, which he formerly worked for in 1995, Dr. Getzel was president of the Assessment, Data Analysis, and Evaluation Services at Johnson & Johnson. He's one of the original members of the core development and marketing group at Corporate Health Strategies, currently a division of Nginx. Earlier in his career, Dr. Getzel was the medical school education program evaluator at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine, where he was appointed to the psychiatric faculty. He earned his doctorate in organizational and administrative studies and his MA in applied social psychology from New York University and BS in psychology from City College in New York. He is currently located in Washington, D.C., and that was just the abbreviated version of his bio. He's done even more than that. The busy man that we're happy to have here today. So take it away, Ron. All right. Well, thank you very much, Kelly and Michael. I appreciate the opportunity to uh, brief everybody as to the state of the art with the Health Project, the C. Everett Coop Award. Um, and uh, actually, my affiliations uh, have uh, shifted in the last uh, few months. I'm now with Johns Hopkins University and the Bloomberg School of Public Health and also the Truven Health Analytics, which used to be called Thomson Reuters, uh, and before that was called MedStat. So uh, uh, things always move and change uh, for the better. So here's the agenda for our session today, and uh, I think what I'd like to do is go through the material uh, in less than a half hour, and then we'll open it up for Q&A uh, for people who are interested in the C. Everett Coop Award and how to apply for that award. Uh, also, I'm going to talk about some uh, common questions that we received about application for the award. Briefly talk about applied research methods. Um, this is often uh, an issue when people submit applications, kind of what level of rigor, what level of evidence is required. So I'll, I'll touch upon that. And then, as I said, you know, we'll have plenty of time for Q&A. So first, we, we do want to honor Dr. C. Everett Koop, uh, who passed away last year. Um, he uh, had a remarkable career. A uh, little bit about Dr. Coop himself. He was born in Brooklyn, New York in 1916. Uh, he was a pediatric surgeon and public health administrator. He was also vice admiral of the Public Health Commission Corps and served as the 13th Surgeon General of the United States under President Ronald Reagan from 1982 through 1989. I think many people see Dr. Coop uh, and remember him very vividly as the nation's doctor. Uh, he uh, He's well remembered for lots of things, but it, uh, he actually started his career as Surgeon General when he was uh, 65 years of age. He was actually in the retirement category at the time. Before that, he was a very well-established uh, neonatal surgeon, and in, he worked in Philadelphia. He performed some groundbreaking surgical procedures on conjoined twins and, and invented techniques back then that are commonly used in infant surgery. Uh, that have since saved thousands of lives. Uh, but he's most remembered uh, for, for his stance on abortion, tobacco, and AIDS. In terms of abortion, uh, even though he was philosophically and religiously opposed to abortion, uh, he declined to state that abortion procedures performed by qualified medical professionals posed a substantial health risk to the women whose pregnancies were being terminated, in spite of the fact that he received a lot of political pressure to endorse that position. On tobacco, uh, he wrote in 1984 that nicotine was an addictive substance similar to that of heroin and cocaine. He also instituted the practice of requiring rotating health warning labels on cigarette packs and required advertising to include those labels. 
And then on the subject of AIDS, uh, he was Surgeon General when the public health authorities first began to take notice of AIDS back in 1981. He wrote the, the official U.S. policy on the disease and took unprecedented actions in mailing AIDS information to every U.S. household. So really remarkable and, and very heroic actions on the part of the Surgeon General that are still remembered today and obviously have had a huge positive public health impact. Uh, here's a picture of Dr. Koop after uh, he became Surgeon General with uh, President Reagan. And now a little bit about the, the award itself um, and, and the health project which he founded uh, 20 years ago. So the health project which houses the C. Everett Koop Award is a nonprofit public-private partnership, a 501c3, that recognizes organizations that have demonstrated health improvements and cost savings, and, and it's important to note that both have to be demonstrated, not just one or, or the other, from health promotion, population health management initiatives. Uh, at its launch in 1994, which is now 20 years ago, uh, the Health Project recognized the following organizations for being meritorious in achieving the criteria for the award. Uh, very familiar names, uh, Johnson & Johnson, Aetna, Dow Chemical, L.L. Bean, Quaker Oats, Steelcase and Union Pacific Railroad. Some of these companies, by the way, have won the awards, uh, award multiple times. And the health project is dedicated to improving Americans' health and reducing the need and demand for medical services through good health practices. So we're, we're not out to uh, curb medical care. What we're out to do is curb the need for medical care uh, because people adopt and live healthy lifestyles. Uh, here's the board of directors for the health project. Uh, the chairman and co-founder of the health project is Carson Beadle, uh, who retired from Mercer a few years ago. I'm the president and CEO. Our vice president is Seth Serksner with Optum. Chief science officer is Jim Fries at Stanford University. And our secretary treasurer is Jim Wheel. And then here's a listing of all the other board members uh, that uh, these are the people uh, all of us, by the way, are, uh, are, are not paid a salary. We're not, uh, uh, we're, we're not given any kind of financial contribution or incentive or, uh, or payment uh, for our uh, being on the board. We're all volunteers. Uh, and the board has uh, changed over time. We're actually now in the process of uh, looking at additional board members. But by and large, it comprises of people who uh, know the field very well, know the operations of program delivery, and most importantly, know what good measurement and evaluation looks like. And uh, can, in many cases, have published articles on the effectiveness of these programs, uh, and uh, also are uh, considered the leaders in management and evaluation of workplace health promotion programs. You can see that they come, and I'll just read the list, uh, names that are very well recognized in the industry, Steve Aldana, David Anderson, David Ballard, Dan Gold, Michelle Hatzis, Rebecca Kelly, Deb Lerner, Joe Lutzinger, Wendy Lynch, Michael O'Donnell, Ken Pelletier, Bruce Pineson, Seth Serksner, Stuart Sill, John Troy, and then we have three ex officio members, Jason Lang, Alan Exum, and Trey McAllister. Uh, here are our friends and supporters. So even though we're a nonprofit and none of us gets paid for our work, we still uh, need uh, funding from uh, our sponsors who annually contribute to the administrative home and infrastructure for the health project. And we thank them enormously for their ongoing support of our effort. Here is our website. Uh, so all you've got to do is go to uh, www.thehealthproject.com and you'll be taken directly to the home page. Uh, where you'll find out all the information you need about the health project and, importantly, how to go about applying for the COOP Award. Uh, this is uh, kind of the first page of the application itself. It gives you quite a bit of in information about what the requirements are, what the criteria are, um, and we've, we've uh, improved the, the logic and the rationale and the explanation behind the COOP Award and what it takes to win the, the award, and also have set some limitations in terms of how much information we would like in terms of uh, words and, and page lengths and, and uh, uh, supportive documentation. Uh, as a reminder, uh, this year's award application is due on May 30th. We typically receive uh, the uh, applications 
uh, obviously by the end of May we review them in June and then the board meets in July to review those applications and make a determination as to who the winners are. 2013 uh, Dell based in uh, Austin, Texas won the award for their Well at Dell program and we also had three honorable mentions in 2013 American Express, Graco and Berkshire Health Systems. Some other organizations that have won the award in the past are listed here, Alcon Labs, Alliance Data, Eastman Chemical, L.L. Bean, Nationwide Mutual, Prudential, State of Nebraska, Dow Chemical, Energy Corporation of America, IBM, Lincoln Industries, and Vanderbilt University. Uh, you'll note that uh, we have given awards to large and small employers, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about uh, kind of what the requirements are, what the criteria are for small employers versus larger employers. Here's some more pictures. Uh, when Dr. Koop was attending our annual award ceremony, he would give a talk and then uh, be kind enough to take pictures with some of the winners. Uh, so these are the last set of pictures before Dr. Koop was unfortunately unable to travel and unable to attend the award. Uh, but we did record him in many ways and uh, his spirit still lives on with the award. Here he is with uh, winner IBM, Vanderbilt University, Dow Chemical, Lincoln Industries, and Energy Corporation of America. So what, what do you need to do in order to win the award? Well, there are three considerations. One is that the program must meet the health project's goal of reducing the need and demand for medical services. Two, share the objectives of Healthy People and Healthy People 2010, Healthy People 2020, health promotion targets. And then finally, prove net health care and or productivity cost reductions while improving population health. So again, we're looking for uh, the simultaneous occurrence of health improvement, population health improvement, and cost reductions or productivity enhancements. Uh, I'll review some of the questions that were often asked about the award. First, uh, are there minimum requirements for application? So uh, no, we don't actually have specific requirements regarding participation rates, risk reduction, cost savings, and so forth because of unique challenges that organizations may face. Obviously, the higher participation rate in the program, participation slash engagement rate, the better. Uh, looking at risk reduction and behavioral changes uh, are important, but we understand that sometimes even a percentage point or, or two of health improvement is very meaningful in terms of population health improvement. So it's, it's important to demonstrate high engagement, high participation, a comprehensive program. We're not uh, so much focused on single focus programs like obesity reduction or tobacco reduction. We're looking really at, at multi-component programs. We're looking at net risk reduction, so not just the people who are at high risk and uh, can we get them to go into low risk, but we're also trying to prevent people at low risk from migrating up into high risk and cost savings that exceed program expenses, which is essentially a different way of saying uh, positive return on investment or net savings from the program. We're also looking for long-term programs as opposed to flash in the pan. You know, we just started a program last week and here are the results. So typically three or more years is what we're, we're looking for in terms of sustainability of these programs. What we evaluate programs are, uh, on is uh, the application of evidence-based practices and there are lots of ways in which to gauge what constitutes evidence-based practices. In fact, uh, we are now asking on a voluntary basis for people to submit their HERO scorecard scores as part of their application simply to guide them through a checklist of, you know, here are the things that demonstrate you've got a, an evidence-based comprehensive program. Uh, other tools that are out there that may be used include the CDC Worksite Health Scorecard, uh, National Business Group on Health has something called the WISC score, uh, and there are a few other tools out there that are essentially a checklist looking at structural and process elements of the program to see whether you've got those things in place. So comprehensiveness of the program, participation rates, health improvements, risk reduction, net cost savings. Um, and are there different requirements for small versus large businesses? So indeed, we understand that if you're a small employer, let's say under 500 workers, you're not going to do a, a large 
uh, scale uh, retrospective insurance claims analysis. First of all, it wouldn't be wise to do it. Uh, you don't have a large enough sample size to do it. And secondly, you, you, uh, it's very resource intensive, both in terms of money and people, to conduct those kinds of studies. So uh, what we're looking for from small employers is cost stabilization, let's say, over the last three to five years. So where everybody else uh, may be seeing increase in costs, now whether that's medical costs or absenteeism or any other category, if you're able to demonstrate cost stabilization, that's pretty good, uh, especially if you couple it with data, and here you do need data, of high participation rates, engagement rates, as well as behavior change and risk reduction in the population. Uh, do you need a published study? Uh, obviously, if, you, if you've done a study, if you're a large organization and publish your results in a peer-reviewed journal, that's great. Uh, and that certainly will inform the discussion about whether uh, your organization merits the award or not. But it's not a requirement. So uh, we do look at reports and analyses. Uh, if they're done by third parties, by objective reviewers and evaluators, all the better. But even if the reports are provided by insurance company, health plans, brokers, or internal staff, uh, that's good enough too, as well, as long as those reports are well done and the evaluations are well done. Uh, is financial impact required or is, or is change in risk status utilization sufficient? We do need both. We, we do need to have the organization demonstrate health behavior change and risk reduction and cost savings. And again, this is what differentiates us from many other organizations out there that confer awards. Uh, we want to see those coupled together. So uh, if an organization makes a claim about a positive ROI, we need to know both the savings and the cost of the program in order to do the calculation of ROI. We, we can't just rely upon the savings alone and, uh, and figure out what the cost of the program was. Uh, we look, can look at reduced utilization being translated into financial impact, uh, but as long as it's not done through other means like benefit plan redesign, rationing programs, outsourcing, utilization review, all those other ways to save money, uh, we're really interested in looking at how health promotion has led to cost savings, not uh, by moving money around on an Excel spreadsheet. And again, there needs to be that link between health improvement and cost savings. Uh, vendor reports, are they uh, as good as independent third-party analysis? Sure. Um, independent analyses always wield greater influence, especially if they're done by established researchers, but uh, we'll take other reports that are done by the insurance carrier, vendor, et cetera, again, as long as we're uh, clear about what the methods are. And we, we are looking for things like ends and tables and graphs, clear annotations and statistics. So just telling us that uh, we achieved a positive ROI of three to one is insufficient. You actually have to show the data to document that statement, or you can't just say we had a 70% reduction in smoking rates. You need to show us the, the pre and post numbers, uh, the ends, and, and really uh, all the information to make the application as transparent as possible. Now, how do we go about determining winners? Well, we use a uh, methodology that's similar to the way uh, NIH or CDC scores applications. Uh, we've, uh, for the last 20 years, used this, used this uh, 100 to 500 scale, where 100 is actually a better score, 500 is, is a bad score. Um, we send out the applications to our reviewers. All of them get a chance to review each application or, or at least 10 applications independently of one another. Uh, they use various grids to figure out how to score those applications. They write comments about the strengths and weaknesses of those applications and come up with a final score, again, between 100 and 500. So uh, 300 is usually the cutoff. Uh, those organizations that score th uh, less than 300 are the ones that are seriously considered and, and discussed in our board meetings. Those that are above 300 typically um, uh, are not good enough, not meritorious enough in order to earn the COOP award. They may be considered uh, for an honorable mention award, however. Um, we uh, do the math. We look at all of these data together and uh, uh, calculate the mean scores. We, we, use, we, we do it with and without outliers, so people who may score at the extremes are included and excluded uh, in the various uh, calculations. Again, this is all done blindly, independent of knowing what the other people are scoring. And by the way, if, if uh, any reviewer has a conflict of interest, if that person is involved with the organization that is submitting an application, 
then that reviewer needs to recuse himself or herself and declare the conflict of interest and that person's opinions and scores are not uh, uh, considered in the overall evaluation. Uh, we then meet together, have a robust discussion, and then re-vote on who we think the, the winner's honorable mentions might be, and that's the final determination after this uh, robust back and forth among reviewers. So how do you go about convincing uh, the Health Project Board or anybody uh, that the organization uh, has improved health and saved money? Um, as I noted, we do set a high bar for winning the Coop Award. This is a table taken from the application itself that reviews some of the criteria, some of the things that we're looking for. So we want you to identify what are the key variables that are being measured. Uh, a little bit, of, uh, not a little bit, we want, we want you to be explicit about study design. I'm going to uh, spend a couple of minutes uh, des describing what the differences between these different designs are. Uh, we want to know about sample sizes. We know, want to know about sample selection methods. You know, where do you get your participants and non-participants from, and how are they uh, matched up to one another? Uh, your data sources, uh, what your outcome results are, uh, very explicitly stated, and then uh, what statistical procedures you provide, you use. So, is it a t-test, chi-square, odds ratio, multivariate analyses, modeling, and so forth and so on? We again, we want you to be very explicit about uh, the methodology that you use and the relevant statistics to see if uh, there are p-values there that show that the results are not due to chance. And then if you have any publications, uh, you want to reference them, you can submit them as part of the appendix or refer to them as part of the application. So a little bit about research methods and the uh, relative level of rigor uh, that you ought to consider in the application. So there are really three broad categories of study design, something called pre-experimental, quasi-experimental, and true experimental. And as you move down from pre to quasi to true, uh, the rigor of the evaluation increases and the validity of your results also increase, increases. So just for the, the people who are, uh, have been away from statistics and research uh, classes for a while, uh, this is a notation I'll use in the next few slides. X refers to the intervention or the program itself, and O refers to the observation or the time at which you collect data. So here's the simplest design. Uh, it's called uh, non-experimental or pre-experimental design. And there are two, exam two ways of doing this. One is on top called a one-group post-test only. That essentially is uh, you've got the program, the intervention, the X, and then you collect data afterwards. So you would ask people, you know, as a result of this program, have you uh, lost weight? Have you quit smoking? Have you increased your exercise? Uh, have you uh, improved quality of life? Are you less stressful and so forth? And that's good. In fact, many uh, evaluations are conducted exactly that way, where you send people questionnaires and ask them about the program and its impact on their, on their health and, and lifestyle and so forth. And that's good, but it, you know, the, um, the one right after it is a little bit better. And that's, that's a one group before and after or pre-post-test pre design where you collect data at baseline, you have the program, and then you collect it again, let's say a year or two later. So you now have a pre-post comparison for the people who've gone through the program. Now, here's an example of a pre-post design. Uh, this is just an example, let's say, medical costs. And the example shown here is uh, baseline. Uh, the, uh, the cost is, let's say, $2. And then uh, after a year, it goes down to a dollar and a half, just as an example. Now, you might say, well, that's great. The program worked because costs have gone down. But if you look at it from a longer time horizon, you'll see that the costs have been steadily been going down, uh, whether or not you've had a program in place or not. So you don't really know whether the program has influenced this reduction in cost. It may be that, in general, costs are going down, and you just happen to be riding the wave of that cost reduction. So that's why a simple pre-test, post-test design usually is not good enough, but it, it may be uh, sufficient in some circumstances. What's better is something called a quasi-experimental design, and what you're doing here is introducing a comparison group. So you've got the pre-post for your program, measures at the beginning, measures at the end, the program itself, uh, but then you also have another group of people who are not exposed to the program. And then you can compare the trends for the people who are exposed to the program 
versus the people who are not exposed to the program. Now, the third design is an experimental design, uh, sometimes referred to as randomized clinical trial. Very, very, very rare and quite honestly not expected for the application to the COOP award. Uh, these are very rare instances. There are some examples of randomized trials conducted in workplace programs, but by and large, most of the studies are uh, quasi-experimental studies and, and pre-experimental experimental studies. Now, here's an example of a pre-experimental study, even though it looks pretty data-rich. Uh, what you've got here are the prevalence of various risk factors on a population at time one, which is T1, and then at time three, two years thereafter. So for example, uh, if you look at uh, high blood pressure, for example, uh, at baseline, 5% of the population had high blood pressure, and then two years later, 4.2% of the population had high blood pressure, and that was about a percentage point reduction, which turns out to be statistically significant. And that was true for most of the risk factors that are shown here, cholesterol, glucose, emotional health, tobacco use, and so forth. Uh, in uh, all of those cases, there was a significant reduction in the risk, and uh, that's pretty good. There were two uh, categories that there were no significant reductions uh, in poor nutrition and obesity, but they were not statistically significant. But, you know, this is not a bad analysis because you've got a lot of people, you're applying statistics, you're showing the ends, and it's pretty transparent as to what's being done here. Now, this example uh, is a step better because here what we've done is in introduced a comparison group. So we not only show the data for the intervention sites, we also show the data for control sites. And then you can compare the experience of the intervention to the control sites and calculate the difference in difference. So how much better uh, the people who are exposed to the program do in comparison to the people who are not exposed to the program. So this is an example of uh, a good analysis that has a comparison group and would be referred to as a quasi-experimental design. Uh, one case study of an example of a company for many, many years uh, that has been evaluating its program and therefore has won the Coop Award on several occasions, and that's Johnson & Johnson, uh, which uh, every few years go back, goes back and evaluates the experience of its program, both in terms of uh, health risk as well as cost. Uh, here's an analysis that looks at the trends in biometric measures for Johnson & Johnson employees. They're the ones in orange at the bottom uh, for blood pressure, cholesterol, and BMI compared to a normative group. So we've got a comparison group for the J&J &J population, and you can see uh, certainly in blood pressure and BMI, they're doing better than the comparison population. Uh, they're also, in this analysis, looking at behaviors uh, they're doing better than the comparison population in terms of eating behaviors, physical inactivity, and tobacco use. Uh, in this example here, they're actually not doing as well as the comparison group, uh, depression and stress. So what that, this means is you don't have to be perfect on every measure. Uh, you just have to show the data. You can show that in general, if there's population health improvement uh, and in most categories, uh, then that's a good thing. Certainly, you're not going to be successful in all categories. Now, this is an example, and this is a, a very sophisticated example of how you do a cost analysis. Uh, the idea here is to find the matches, the identical twins, to the J&J &J employees in a normative population, and then match them up as well as you can at baseline on demographic variables, on cost variables, disease variables, and so forth, so that you're looking at apples and apples, same people over time, and then you can follow their trends over time once you've uh, established the baseline group of participants and non-participants or people exposed to the program versus not exposed to the program and see if their trend lines differ. And in this case with J&J, &J, their healthcare cost trends that are adjusted for inflation did differ by about uh, close to four percentage point difference per year. And in this case, that was significant and it did save Johnson & Johnson money and actually also provided them with a positive ROI. So let me summarize by saying that what we try to do with a health project is to recognize those organizations that have documentary evidence that their programs have had a positive impact on health and also achieve cost savings. 
and as some of the examples that I've shown, you know, that is possible. You can you can improve health and save money, uh, but what you've got to do to win the award is to have evidence of both. Size is not important. Small employers can apply, but results are. They've got to be credible results that our panel of reviewers uh, looks at and says, yeah, that that uh, that makes sense from a data standpoint. And there is a growing body of evidence out there that suggests that well-designed, evidence-based, comprehensive programs can improve the health of workers, lower their risk for disease, save businesses money by reducing health-related losses, limiting absence and disability and safety incidents, heighten morale, improve work relations, improve worker performance and productivity, and then overall have a positive impact on the financial performance of that institution. So with that, uh, Michael and Kelly, I'll turn the floor back over to you, and we'll open it up for any questions that may be out there. Thanks, Ron. That was great. Uh, lots of good information and um, lots of good um, visuals on how this really has worked for uh, organizations like J&J. &J. Uh, so please type your questions in, uh, and we will get through as many of them as we can. Um, you know, I was thinking while people are typing, I was thinking, you know, I can't, and maybe it's because I am so young, but I cannot remember a Surgeon General who did more for the whole, you know, public health population health of a country more so than than uh, C. Everett Coop. Am I uh, am I totally jaded? Well, I mean, if you think back of Surgeon Generals and names that we can remember, there aren't very many out there, right? Uh, uh, cer certainly, uh, some of the earlier ones. Uh, I mean, David Satcher is a name who, who's remembered, and uh, some of the surgeon generals who were very early involved in terms of uh, smoking reports that were produced in 1965. We just celebrated uh, a, uh, a, a an anniversary for the initial uh, smoking cessation reports um, developed in, in uh, 50 years ago. Those those names are memorable. But I think if you ask most Americans today, first of all, they're not going to know who the current Surgeon General is, or even the acting Surgeon General is. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, uh, by the way, that's Boris Lushniak. But uh, uh, very few names uh, uh, are, are linked back to Dr. Coop, um, uh, except for Dr. Coop in terms of sur a famous Surgeon General who had a huge impact. And he, he took his position very seriously. He, he realized that it was a bully pulpit that uh, he could get a lot of messages out there and influence public policy, and he did that very successfully. I would agree. Uh, let's see, okay, qu we've got questions. Thanks for that. Uh, Tricia wants to know, um, are wellness companies able to apply for the award? Well, we, we uh, ask that an employer uh, apply, or an employer may be a state or you know any other entity, but uh, they have to be the people uh, who submit the application. So uh, obviously you can work with a vendor, uh, and many applications uh, that have been received are those that are uh, written and collaborated with, with vendors, and they put them together. Uh, but the applicant needs to be the organization where the program was instituted, not a vendor that uh, has these kinds of programs. Okay, makes sense to me. Uh, let's see, Len wants to know, Here's a, here's a giant uh, can of worms, or at least it is to me. It's a little bit mind-boggling. Uh, how do, actually do you calculate ROI? Medical claims, cost of wellness staff, cost of programs? Do you curve or carve out um, maternity claims, chiropractic claims? How do you? How can you do that? Well, I mean, there are, there are many ways of doing it, and, and quite honestly, it's as much an art as it is a science. But very simply, uh, you would look at total claims, uh, total allowed amounts, essentially, covered charges, um, for people who are exposed to the program versus people who are not. Uh, and then look to see if there's a difference over time, there's a divergence of those costs over time. Now, whether you want to uh, carve out uh, specific categories of claims, for example, we do leave out people who are pregnant from uh, these studies because they, they're obviously going to lose and gain weight and have different costs. So that's that's an obvious exclusion uh, from the analysis. You also want to limit time, uh, the, the age of the people, usually 18 to 64. Uh, you want to uh, uh, probably exclude people who are fully insured claim, fully insured plans versus uh, PPO or fee-for-service type plans. So there are a lot of decisions that go mm -hmm. into this. 
So then you get you're now getting into the the micro details of how to conduct these studies. Um, and for that, you know, you really have to basically put together an analysis plan and have somebody else review it to make sure it makes sense. Hmm. Super. Well, I wonder, um, do you, I guess, where do you see the Coop Award? Oh, I still wait for more people, more uh, questions. Where do you see the Coop Award fitting in um, going forward? I mean, I think it, uh, to me, it's the gold standard. Um, but how do you, um, how can we help people rise to that standard? Well, first of all, I, I do see that research studies and evaluations that are being conducted are being conducted better than they were 20 years ago. I mean, quite honestly, in the old days, uh, some of the studies and some of the applications for the Coop Award uh, relied upon relatively simple descriptive data, uh, whereas today uh, the criteria, uh, the bar has been raised, as I said, and there are many more sophisticated people doing the analyses and many, many more sophisticated people evaluating those studies. So uh, it's a pretty high standard. We don't we don't have a lot of winners every year. Uh, last year it was just one winner. Um, uh, and, and I think that people uh, continue to strive to win the award. And I think it's really important that this is uh, something that is valued within an organization, uh, that it is based upon hard data, and people can point to winners of the Coop Award as organizations that really do have good evidence that their programs do what they're supposed to do, which is to improve health and save money. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, let's see. More questions. Um, I get. Are, are there on the website? Are there resources to help people? with the application or is it basically just the application? I guess, how how can people get from not applying to applying? Well, first, yes, uh, the, the website does have the applications themselves and, and in fact, even the, the feedback, the positive feedback on those applications. Um, but that's that's uh, probably the most informative thing that they can do is, is go and read the applications, look at the evidence, look at the data, look at how uh, the information was presented, formatted. Uh, and then, uh, if they don't have the skills in-house, uh, go to universities, consulting houses, data firms, and so forth to ask for help. Uh, it, to do good research, to do good evaluation, is not something you can do in your garage on the weekend. To be honest, it is. It is a skill set. <laughs> it's something that uh, requires quite a, a number of years of training and experience in doing it. Uh, I'm still learning how to do it, even though I've been doing it for 30 years now. Uh, so if, uh, if an organization is serious about it, uh, they should uh, get some help in figuring out how to, how to apply. Oh, that's a really good idea. I hadn't thought of going to a university where they might be able to get, especially if they're a smaller company, might be able to get some assistance at little or no cost. Um, so let's see. More questions. Uh, <laughs> come on, you guys. Um, uh, I guess I could say, I, I could mention that we have in the past done quite a few webinars that are available on HP Live with uh, Coop Award winners. So those are probably also really good uh, resources for people to go and really see um, almost live examples of how people have done uh, this successfully. Yeah, the other place to learn about it, of course, is uh, the annual Hero Forum where the Coop Awards are given. So each year at the Hero Forum, that's when the, uh, the annual C. Everett Coop Award is conferred. Um, and uh, at that point, oftentimes, you get a chance to uh, hear directly from the winners and sit down with them and talk to them, have lunch with them and find out firsthand what they did and how they went about doing it. So that certainly is, is a great opportunity to learn more kind of the, the inside baseball approach of how to how these studies are done and, and also how the programs are run. Hmm. You can do a great study and find out that the program didn't work and that's that's no fun. Uh, so you've <laughs> got to have a combination of a great program and a great evaluation of that program. Uh, and then you, you hit a home run and you, you can win the award. Excellent. Yeah, that's a really good point. Yeah, uh, the hero 
conferences, one of my two or three favorite conferences. I think it's especially good because it's not so big, so you can really sit down and have coffee with somebody that, um, you know, that has done that, this thing that uh, maybe your organization has uh, has interested interest in pursuing. Uh, and I think it's in the fall. Do you know, do you know when or where it is this year? Is it, no, oh, last year was Florida. Well, I think it's in San Diego, California, and toward the end of September. I don't have the exact date in front of me. Okay, well, a good opportunity to go to San Diego anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you just go to the uh, the HERO website. I think it's thehero.org, and, and you can find out more. Okay. All right, you guys. You are um, you're going to run out of time uh, if you don't give me some more. Give me some more good questions. Good. Well, I guess, um, let's see, do you, if people, uh, it may be that they are pondering mightily and they're just not coming to them. Is there a way to uh, communicate with you after this or is there a better, a better place to direct their questions? Uh, sure. I mean, uh, my email address is uh, ron.getzel at truvenhealth.com. Okay. So if anybody wants to send me an email, uh, they're welcome to do so. All right. Okay. Well, thank you very you much, Ron. Questions, oh, maybe I didn't Michael? see them. Oop. Yep, I'm here, they Kelly. They came in while you were wrapping up. There's one in the chat box and there's one in the question box. Oh, well, Okay. All right. I don't know why I didn't see that. That is so weird. Thanks, Kelly. Uh, okay. Here's one, uh, one from Lynn. She's saying, do you receive a, do you receive a score after each submission if over $300, $300, 300 points? All right. I didn't, could you ask that again? Okay. She says, do you receive a score after each submission if over 300 points? Um, I guess the question we is, actually, are you getting feedback? Yeah, we, we don't uh, give out the scores, but we do provide feedback. So everybody who submits an application that is reviewed uh, will receive uh, feedback on the pluses and minuses of that application. Ah, okay. So really there's no, no reason not to apply if you have, you know, even if you're thinking you don't have a ghost of a chance because you're going to get some really valuable feedback. Right. I mean, Within reason, cases, of course. Not, yeah, every sophomore will get something that's really out there, and we'll just say it was it was uh, not suitable for the Cooper Award and, and won't review it. But that's rare, rarely the, the case. And usually the applications are, are pretty substantial, and they've got a lot in them, and, and people uh, deserve to get feedback. There's no fee, by the way. There's no charge to apply for the award or to receive the, the award, for that matter. So it's all free of charge. Uh, and indeed, as you point out, uh, getting the feedback on, on the program and the evaluation of that program is very valuable. Yeah, I would think so. Okay, well, Kelly, did I miss anything else? Okay. Just that we have a link to their page on our site. Okay. All right. Okay, well, I wait, guess. Please, wait. <laughs> every, time, every time you wrap up, somebody okay, types I... in a question. <laughs> Okay. And so you're like, okay, goodbye, and it goes bleep, there it is. Okay, well, then I'm not going to talk anymore, Kelly. You take this question. <laughs> okay. Um, let's see. In a program that is managed for several years in Kentucky, oops, wait a minute. Hold on. I think I'm cutting off part of this question. Okay. Okay. In a program that is managed for several years in Kentucky, management thought they had not yet enough to apply for the Coop Award, although the program was successful. So tips on letting management know that they don't have to be perfect to apply. Well, yeah. Uh, if, if the organization feels that it has enough information to document health improvement and cost savings, and it's been around for, as I said, three or so years or more, then um, go ahead and submit go, uh, and uh, get feedback on it. Yeah, it sounds like submitting even if you're not 100% confident would really be valuable because that feedback is going to help you get there maybe in the next year or maybe even in that year. Who knows? Well, exactly. In fact, many of the applicants who have submitted in, in previous years, they get feedback on their program. 
uh, they resubmit. Uh, we've had uh, people of one honorable mention. They've gotten good feedback on what was missing, what was lacking, and then came back and, and in turn won the award. So yeah, it's, it's a good feedback mechanism. Super. Well, I hesitate to say, uh, <laughs> thank you, Ron. <laughs> Stop that, Lynn. <laughs> She said, of course, I'm not going to I'm not going to close this at all. We'll just stop talking at some point. OK, can you win the award if you don't have a tobacco free campus? That's an important variable. You don't win the award for that alone. No, uh, you have to demonstrate how that coupled with other health promotion programs have reduced popula uh, population health risks mm -hmm. and saved money. So if, again, a single focus program is not as compelling as a comprehensive multi-component program. So you could literally not have, you could be doing really, really well, but not have been able to go smoke free and you could still be competitive? Right. So if you're able to show that uh, you've reduced risk in, in most of the risk factors out there, let's say smoking has not been reduced, but obesity and, and blood pressure and cholesterol and glucose and a few other things have been reduced. Mm -hmm. then that'll be considered in the analysis. Certainly also, you know, the characteristics of the population, what, you know, is it a blue collar workforce? You know, where are they located? Uh, what's, what are the demographics of the population? And what are the interventions that are being put in place? Now, having said all that, uh, having a, a smoke-free tobacco policy is one of the easiest things an organization can do. And I would put it at the top of the list of uh, no-brainers. Mm. But if for some reason, some reason or another, an organization decides not to do it, then they can look at other risk factors and how they've been able to influence uh, those. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess that goes kind of back to the you don't have to be perfect to apply. You, mm -hmm. uh, you, know, you just have to be working on it and working towards it. Sure. All right, Lynn, thank you. And uh, no, I wasn't yelling at you. I do really appreciate <laughs> your questions. <laughs> but now, Ron, quick. Have a lovely rest of your day. Thank you so much for being here, and I look forward to chatting with you again soon. Well, appreciate the opportunity, Michael and Kelly, for letting us give an update. Uh, so all the very best to you, and thanks. Have a good Bye. weekend. Thanks, you too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.